Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for the uh, invitation. Um, I have to say, perhaps uh, slightly at odds with your uh, usual subject and uh, topic areas, but I think actually quite an astute uh, invitation and observation uh, by Katie. Um, the, the kind of stuff I'm going to talk to you about today uh, is based on the relationship uh, between uh, the kind of primacy of highways infrastructure planning in the post-war period uh, and its relationship uh, to uh, the pedestrian environments that were created. Uh, I'm going to use Manchester as a case study, um, but really what I'm talking about is what I like to term the renewal cities uh, of the north of England, and I like to make a distinction between uh, the renewal cities and the recovery cities in the post-war period. Uh, the recovery cities like Coventry, uh, and Exeter and Plymouth, who'd ostensibly completed their construction uh, before 1955, and the renewal cities, uh, Birmingham, Manchester, Liverpool, Sheffield, Glasgow, Newcastle, etc., uh, that really began their reconstruction after 1959. Uh, and this was largely due to the relaxing of uh, building licensing in 54, and also a kind of exodus of uh, investment money uh, where everything had kind of been realised in the capital, and uh, investors and developers from London started to. Uh, take opportunities in provincial cities. Uh, I refer to it here as uh, Buchananism, uh, and I don't deploy that metonym uh, lightly. Uh, I think that uh, after Buchanan, uh, there was a certain type of environment that was created in our cities. I'm not here to talk about whether that's uh, good or bad to talk about its qualities, uh, but I'm interested in the fact that it's happened and actually the rapidity uh, with which it's vanishing. So in Manchester, uh, in the uh, 60s, the early 60s, the first planning uh, department was formed uh, under a really interesting chap called John Miller. Uh, John's still alive, uh, lives down in uh, Wilmslow. Um, he really took up the mantle of uh, replanning the city centre uh, from Roland Nicholas, who'd uh, prepared the 1945 plan. Um, although Miller's work was very much uh, kind of embedded in a realism where Nicholas's work, uh, by his own admission, uh, was a kind of ambitious dream. Um, the major tool of the planning authorities uh, in the post-war period was the comprehensive development area. And here we can see the six comprehensive development areas of Manchester as outlined in the 1967 city centre map. Uh, they are the cathedral area, uh, Market Street, Civic Area, Central Station, Mosley Street and the Higher Education Precinct. And in fact, those of you who are familiar with the city uh, will know that these uh, areas largely picked out the shape of what was to come over the next 50 years, uh, perhaps with the exception of Mosley Street, and I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later on. One might assume uh, that these development areas followed the pattern of uh, bomb damage sustained in World War II, uh, but actually with this overlay you can see that that coincidence uh, wasn't necessarily the case. Uh, and in fact, uh, a German visitor anecdotally uh, to the city in the mid-1960s uh, said to a former colleague of mine that she was devastated about the destruction that had been wrought on the area uh, kind of around the uh, higher education precinct here. And in fact, that was the uh, clearance for uh, the preparation for making Mancunian Way and not the Germans. Um, so this uh, map here is an extract from the 67 city centre map, uh, which was the formal submission uh, to the government in lieu of the development plan. And the red areas uh, indicate the kind of desired extents of uh, pedestrian infrastructure in the city centre. Uh, some of this was designed to be at first floor level uh, and some of it uh, at ground floor level. Um, but interestingly on here, you can see very strongly picked out is the route here of uh, the inner ring road, uh, which actually was never completed uh, to this route uh, and took around 60 years to be uh, fully linked uh, together. Salford have a commemorative plaque uh, from 2006, a uh, 59 year history of the inner ring road. Uh, but that's another lecture that's about an hour long uh, and I'm not giving that one today. Um, <clears throat> it's worth just picking out here uh, this area I always use Central Reference Library. It's round, it's a good point to navigate about. Uh, uh, this is the entertainment district, uh, which never occurred. Uh, but I'll be talking a little bit about the, the kind of residue of this as a plan uh, later on. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Sir, Sir Colin Buchanan's report, Traffic in Towns, um, really, I think, ratified uh, a kind of zeitgeist uh, for this momentum towards the, the separation of pedestrians and traffic. 
Uh, there were a few sort of seminal schemes in the 1950s uh, that really led towards this uh, being a kind of popular uh, mode of uh, planning and development, uh, notably uh, Sergei Cadley's High Paddington uh, that was published uh, by AD, uh, and competition entries by the Smithsons uh, and uh, James Sterling, uh, uh, Golden Lane and Sheffield University, uh, 1953 <coughs> and 1959. Uh, so Buchanan uh, has been sort of roundly turned upon uh, for uh, determining these uh, uh, um, objectives uh, that city centre planners uh, took up with gusto. Uh, but really, you know, when you read Buchanan closely, uh, it's evident that in, in his mind, uh, weren't these the creation of these kind of horrible landscapes that, that we kind of recall and, and popularly uh, kind of despise. Uh, his was one that was about uh, environment. And, and he was uh, very much an advocate that if you were to separate uh, traffic and pedestrians and create uh, these fantastic pedestrianised plazas and city centres that were uh, open to all, uh, then you had to mitigate uh, very successfully against uh, the types of highway infrastructure that you might create. Now, obviously, local authorities in the renewal cities in the 1960s were heavily dependent on uh, the incoming capital and actually were held to ransom uh, in many respects by the developers. If the developers' money didn't come into the city, uh, then the development didn't happen. Uh, and whilst I'm talking here to many people who won't remember that, I do talk to people who have living memories uh, of what it was like in Manchester and Liverpool in the late 1950s, uh, and actually the lack of money that had come in 15, 16 years after the end uh, of the Second World War. Um, so in Manchester, probably uh, the most explicit uh, example of this type of uh, first floor pedestrian environment that I'm talking about uh, is in the university precinct. Um, this is an extract uh, from the interim report uh, of 1964, uh, one year after uh, Wilson and Womersley uh, were commissioned to produce the plan. Uh, in fact, uh, Lewis Womersley was invited uh, by uh, the university and the city council uh, to uh, act as consultant planner uh, on his own. And it was Womersley who invited Wilson uh, to join him. Uh, and so the commission from the university uh, was the thing that formed uh, the planning partnership of Wilson Womersley. Uh, for better or for worse, uh, they went on to produce uh, Hume Crescent and the Arndale Centre in Manchester. Uh, make of that what you will. Uh, but both of them had a uh, pedigree uh, in looking at uh, aerial uh, environments. Uh, Womersley. Uh, directed uh, Sheffield City Council Architects Department who delivered uh, Park Hill uh, and Wilson was the Chief Architect and Planner for Cumbernauld and here we can see a picture of uh, Cumbernauld's uh, megastructure from the town centre. Um, most notably from the plan on the left uh, is the fact that Oxford Road, uh, if you know Manchester and you know Oxford Road, it's a sort of heavily bus laden corridor of certain cycling doom. Um, uh, is down the centre of the plan, uh, so kind of here. Uh, so you can see in this plan it's very much uh, diminished. Uh, and this is in relation to the highways infrastructure planning elsewhere. Uh, also in the interim report, there was a heavy focus here on the creation of these pedestrian environments. And these sketches by Peter Wright kind of mimic uh, the sorts of illustrations that we encounter uh, in the Buchanan report. Uh, so this is the Royal Northern College of Music, uh, this is Oxford Road looking north, uh, this is Oxford Road looking south, uh, this was a proposed chaplaincy for the Polytechnic uh, which was never built, uh, this is Oxford Road looking north again, this is the site of the uh, Maths Tower, uh, it was always intended to have a tower, the Maths Tower itself was demolished in 2006 and I'll come on to that. Um, but the tower was intended to act as a, a landmark uh, and a focal point for the university from the rest of the city. Um, these two extracts then uh, start to talk about the relationship between uh, the creation of these pedestrian areas uh, and the uh, highways planning of the period. So again, Oxford Road uh, down the middle. And here we can see Cambridge Street and Upper Brook Street that are proposed here to be re-engineered as uh, dual carriageways uh, to deliver... Uh, people toward the city centre and toward the uh, kind of interstitial piece of ring road 
uh, which became uh, Mancunian Way, uh, the aerial flyover. If you can just pick out the yellow areas here, the, the yellow areas are the uh, designed areas of uh, first floor uh, pedestrian landscape. Uh, and again here uh, we can see uh, Oxford Road shown as simply as a service road uh, and no longer as a direct uh, distributor road. Uh, and that's a Mancunian Way publicity brochure. So the way the road was drawn varied uh, in the plans. Uh, and so depending on which audience uh, Wilson Womersley were playing to, uh, depended on how the plans uh, were drawn. Uh, this is a drawing I recovered from the University of Manchester Estates archive uh, and focuses heavily uh, on uh, these pedestrian uh, routes, really, connecting uh, the post-war development areas of Hume uh, and Brunswick uh, laterally in a kind of east-west uh, trajectory. Now, this is about the idea of town and gown, uh, so embedded in the expansion of the university wasn't just uh, the notion uh, that the university itself would expand, but actually that the university would serve uh, the local population and there would be a host of activities and events uh, and facilities that the local uh, resident population could also draw upon. And this was a popular idea uh, in education uh, through the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, but Oxford Road here is very much uh, shown as uh, still a main road um, again, uh, the inner ring road uh, was drawn and drawn and drawn and drawn and drawn uh, and was part of Manchester's ambitions from 1945 all the way through until it, it formally uh, had its demise in 1977, uh, but parts of it were reawoken uh, in the 80s. This is the route shown of the intermediate uh, ring road. Um, so we're up near the Royal Infirmary of Manchester here. Uh, this is the medical school. Oxford Road is running uh, left to right on this drawing. This would be the re-engineered Upper Brook Street, uh, and this the re-engineered uh, Cambridge Street. Uh, this is the Joint Matriculation Board uh, building. But again, uh, this idea of this, uh, this ring road plowing its way through here, uh, but then these high-level connections between the expanded hospital and the medical school, uh, parts of the university uh, and Whitworth Park. And I can only assume uh, that this is why the uh, Whitworth Park student residences uh, were designed with their entrance uh, so high up in the air. Uh, my wife actually lived in these uh, in the 1990s. Very peculiar uh, experience to visit, to ascend, only to descend again to the uh, kitchens which were down on the ground floor. Uh, and this is a shot of the medical school, uh, just to um, show... Uh, where the connection would have been, so that earlier plan would have connected into uh, this part of the block. In terms of the uh, elements of the plan that were constructed, uh, the maths tower was the most southerly uh, of the buildings that would introduce you to uh, this kind of first floor extended uh, urban sequence. Uh, and so the Sherwin Hicks Tower was built in 1968, and here you can just see uh, the ramp uh, public ramp that would take you up uh, from the ground floor uh, into uh, this colonnaded area uh, with the high soffit, at which point you would enter the maths building. So the entrance to the maths building was at the first floor level. And this bridge connected uh, onwards into uh, other buildings. This is a view uh, up the ramp. Uh, this is a view from the 1970s, albeit of a 1968 uh, building. And you could ride your bike up and down here as well. Uh, and, and park your bike at the top. Uh, this ramp then connected uh, here uh, across to the Kilburn building, uh, which was designed for the computer uh, facility, the computer department in 1972. Uh, and the Kilburn building in the, on the left-hand side uh, is this uh, building here. Eventually, uh, the chaplaincy Oxford Road Chaplaincy would fill in the gap between the Kilburn building and the precinct centre, and one could walk up the ramp of the Maths Tower through the Kilburn building, which had an open courtyard at first floor level, uh, through uh, the Chaplaincy, across the bridge of the precinct centre, and actually over all the way here um, to the Royal Northern College of Music, which you saw uh, in the first set of sketches. <clears throat> This was the precinct centre, uh, as was. Uh, after 
uh, the bridge had been severed uh, to the Royal Northern College of Music. So this kind of dark area here uh, used to lead to another bridge which would lead you onto the Royal Northern College of Music itself with its main entrance at uh, first floor with a set of steps that went up uh, its side on uh, um, Booth Street West. Um, as I said, I'm not here to talk necessarily about the quality, uh, the architectural quality of these environments, uh, more really about the kind of richness of the spatial experience that one encountered as one moved uh, through uh, these spaces. There was a fantastic sense of compression and release. Uh, there was something great about being lifted up into the sky, but that everybody else was able to access uh, these spaces as well. It's quite egalitarian. These were public spaces within the university, and obviously as time has gone on and security has changed, the nature of these spaces has been really significantly altered. In fact, you know, most of it has now uh, vanished. This space is no longer uh, with us. Uh, so this was the Royal Northern College of Music with its bridge waiting to be connected uh, to uh, the precinct centre. Uh, and over here, uh, is the site of Manchester Polytechnic, uh, and this is the bridge connection uh, when it was made. Uh, so the building you can see over on the far right here is the Mabel Talcote building uh, of Manchester Polytechnic, and that was designed uh, by local authority architects. But you can see here that there's, a, there's an overhanging soffit designed to take the connection once the Royal Northern College of Music could connect to the building in the middle here. Now this site in the middle wasn't developed until the 1990s uh, as a Geoffrey Manson building, by which time the whole agenda of this type of space uh, was no longer uh, part of the planning objectives uh, for the city, indeed for many cities. Uh, and this is the, uh, the staircase up to the main entrance to the Royal Northern College, which was at this level. And if you visit that building today, uh, you, you enter much further down uh, Booth Street West here, where you can still see uh, the, the sort of Spanish steps and the type of spatial experience that uh, Bickerdyke, Allen and Rich, uh, the architects, wished you to have. Um, there were further uh, developments planned uh, for Oxford Road that would also uh, kind of capitalise on this idea of the separation of pedestrians and traffic. Uh, the Sports Centre by Wilson Womersley uh, is designed for a site more or less where the aquatic centre uh, now exists. So even though this didn't take place, uh, the notion of some form of leisure building being put on that site uh, uh, kind of was sustained uh, and actually realised. And that's one of the things that I'm really interested in in my research, is the legacy of these plants and actually how long these ideas are gestated and continue for uh, before they are manifest. Uh, this is Richard Shepherd Robson and Partners uh, planning for... Uh, Manchester Polytechnic, uh, which was really about gathering together uh, the existing technical colleges of the city, uh, as well as introducing uh, some new buildings to create uh, the new Polytechnic uh, in 1972. Uh, this is the Mabel Talcote building that I referred to, the Royal Northern College of Music, uh, and the site that wasn't delivered until the 1990s, uh, the sports centre that you've just seen, uh, a building that was never realised uh, along Oxford Road. Uh, this is where Johnny Roadhouse Music and Babylon Pizza, great chilli beef pizzas, by the way, uh, in the bottom of there. Uh, and you can see this, this alluring extension of the first floor walkway underneath the soffit of Mancunian Way, uh, which for me, quite an exhilarating experience, if you like urban motorways. Uh, <laughs> On a rainy day, uh, if you're in the car park underneath Mancunian Way here, you can have quite a lively urban shower uh, from the spray, uh, if you so desire. Um, but obviously that never came to be. But just the idea of being able to touch the kind of precast soffit is quite exciting, I think. Uh, and this is a model uh, of the very same, and you can just see uh, the, the little walkway there uh, underneath uh, Mancunian Way, obviously with a ramp there connecting back uh, to All Saints Park, and this, this side of the development never came to be. Uh, this building was realised as, uh, as the Cavendish building. Uh, also designed to accommodate that were not just uh, education buildings, um, but uh, other commercial buildings within the Oxford Road corridor. Um, this is a proposal for the National Computing Centre, as imagined by John Seward of Crooks and Seward and Peter Sainsbury in 1967. Um, Harold Wilson came to Manchester in 67 to 
open the Mancunian way. Uh, and uh, Seward uh, was contacted uh, by uh, other MPs uh, to say, can you knock something up quickly overnight so that uh, Harold Wilson has got another announcement to make whilst he's here to open the motorway? Um, the National Computing Centre had been proposed uh, in 1964-65 in wake of the white heat speech, uh, but nothing had really come to fruition except for this building here at the back of the plan, uh, which was a very, very modest uh, kind of grey uh, tin-clad uh, computer centre uh, that had the computer in it itself, uh, but none of the uh, attendant facilities. Um, no one really knew what the computer centre was for or how many people would work in it, uh, which I think is one of the reasons why it has this form. Uh, if you look at the first, the early plan here, uh, it's, it's a kind of cruciform plan wrapping around this existing building. And so they couldn't have had less floor area but touched the edges uh, of the site uh, with any more success than they did. And I also speculate that the kind of inverted ziggurat form uh, as well as having the soffit that would have accommodated a, a first floor walkway, uh, was about kind of this building trying to overstate its presence, kind of giving it this kind of muscularity uh, that, that was uh, sort of testament to uh, a national uh, endeavour. Similarly, uh, plans for the BBC. Uh, this is the BBC North as imagined, uh, but not delivered uh, by BDP uh, around 1966. Uh, BDP M&E went on to be heavily involved in the BBC North headquarters, but that was actually designed by R.A. Sparks, uh, BBC architect. Uh, but again here, this kind of overhanging upper level uh, would have provided uh, the, the space and the situation for uh, the continuation of the first floor walkway. Uh, just quickly then to move into central Manchester and to talk a little bit about the residue, uh, the Mosley Street area that I referred to earlier uh, again, kind of persisted on the drawing board uh, of the local authority uh, and in models, uh, but never uh, came to be itself. But a few buildings were built uh, within there uh, that were designed to accommodate these ramps themselves. There's uh, Piccadilly Plaza, which, as you know, has its entrance at uh, first floor, albeit they now have a, a ground floor version. Uh, the Eagle Star Insurance Building, uh, and also a, a bank for Williams Glynn by HS Fairhurst. Uh, this is the Eagle Star building, uh, acquired by, uh, indicates uh, it was about to be demolished, as does the fact that uh, Connell Brothers gave me the photos. Um, but just here, this is the end here, you can see the walkway, was, there, was, there was no office space uh, in that gap. Uh, it was designed to accommodate a walkway that would go all the way along Mosley Street. Uh, William Deacon's bank has been uh, demolished as well to make way for uh, York House, uh, Denton Corker Marshall scheme on the corner of New York Street and Mosley Street. And uh, this had the first 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 floor level deciduous tree uh, in Manchester being admired by these uh, bankers here. Uh, and this is a little anecdote about Louis Kahn and the Commodores. Uh, I'll let you read that. Who would have thought? Uh, so that's from a, a former colleague of mine, John Proctor Bishop, uh, who was a lecturer uh, during the 60s and 70s and uh, uh, brought Khan uh, to the city. Uh, he wasn't uh, the promoter of the Commodores uh, gig. But, uh, uh, and perhaps the, the biggest piece of city centre that was realised comprehensively uh, was uh, the Market Street area. Uh, and I'm being slightly uh, sarcastic here by saying uh, look at what we've lost um, because I don't think that the image uh, on the right is particularly uh, alluring but really the question for me is uh, where does this stuff still exist uh, and actually is it too late for us to start thinking uh, about its preservation now the obvious examples in London uh, the Barbican etc uh, but I'm certain in the renewal cities right across the north that the same thing has happened as has already happened uh, in Manchester. And it might actually be too late to even think about uh, what these environments are worth. So, thanks. <laughs>